push this button and then say, Jack, dog doing it. It's going. Congratulations. <laughs> American profits. Sorry, I'm trying to get the glare out of there. American profits, Jack Jenkins. Oh, my the gosh. Yeah, that, congrats. Dude, it's a massive tome. <laughs> it's on my iPad, but it looks cute. Yeah. It looks, it's, it's, I didn't know it looks like that when it, it comes in the iPad. That's that's visually impressive. Wow. <laughs> Boom. Well, hey, uh, big fan of this book. Congratulations. Dan Dietrich uh, also knows your work. Um, Dan is yeah. a part of the Vogue, Vogue Common Good world, is a, uh, a, a musician in his own right. Mm. A little song called The Hymn to the 81% made a big deal on the internet. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, Dan yeah. Dietrich. No way. <laughs> Yep, that was, that was me. Okay. An internet free you. <laughs> I can see just like your background just filled with music, um, musical instruments. Like that is, oh, yeah. that's a pretty cool <laughs> setup there. Awesome. It's pretty great. Well, home studio. Yeah. Well, uh, um, Jack, do you see your recording happening in the Zencaster on that little window? Do you see a- I do. I do. It, it, it shows with the little up and down arrows and the stuff, and it says it's recording in progress. That's all. Thing. Excellent. So. Well, uh, we're going to have both an audio version of that for the podcast and then this video version that if things turn out well, we'll share with people on the internet so they can see awesome. the massive size. <laughs> book. Hey, and I will tell you, I, I care a lot about books. Uh, I know most people, you know, they, they give or take. What I care most about in a book is what the feel, the visual feel of the book is. And and honestly, not to be a nerd, but the fonts and the fonts on the cover of a book mean a lot to someone someone with my sensibilities. And that font that they chose for Jack Jenkins is stellar. That I don't know if you had anything to do with that. I, I did, in fact. I, I, I come I have a little bit of design sensibility, but the truth is my sister isn't a, a designer for a living. She's an interior designer. And so there's actually a whole artistic strain going back generations in my family. So they weighed in heavily, um, among other people, about like shifting of fonts. And then I don't, they, I don't think they chose that specific one, but we, it, we were part of the discussion to get to that one. <laughs> wow. Well, it is, uh, uh, it is smashing. As it's they a great say. Thank you. The, the J pokes down a little bit. Yes, you know. Throwing a sand, throwing a serif amongst sand serifs, you know, just, just yeah. all about the fonts. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's fantastic. All right, so it's not all about the fonts; it's also about the <laughs> words that make that are used uh, by those fonts. American prophets, the religious roots of progressive politics and the ongoing fight for the soul of the country. Now, I'm guessing you came up with that title and the subtitle before Joe Biden launched his campaign with a sort of campaign theme of fighting for the soul of the country yeah yeah it's uh, it's been a little frustrating because i because i keep wanting to say because i got used to saying it for my book and then he released his his campaign which is fighting for the soul of the nation oh. um, as opposed to the country and then i got i reflexively start like wanting to say his campaign slogan because i have had to type it in in stories i've written and then remember no my book Technically, we called it first. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. It's technically we had it first. You had it for a long time. So, all yeah. right. So uh, everyone will now know you as the author of American Prophets, the soon-to-be oh, best-selling tome on the rise of the progressive political movement in the country. But tell people what else you have done. You are a you are a journalist for the Religion Religion News Service. Yes. You have a divinity degree, I believe. I do. You have uh, worked in the in the religious sectors. You've worked in media. You you have a you have a wide range of experience that brings you to this to this book. Yeah, um, I so I, I I grew up in South Carolina and I uh, kind of grew up in a religious community and then I actually went to my undergraduate college is a college called Presbyterian College and it's affiliated with the Presbyterian Church USA. And I did, you know, religious stuff when I was there. And then coming out of college through a confluence of accidental events, um, I was supposed to go into the Peace Corps. And then the deployment got deferred for a little, for like two or three months. And so I had to kill time. Um, ended up, and I mentioned this in the book, I did a little campaign work with the Barack Obama campaign during that interim. And then suddenly got interested in uh, politics. And then while I was on the campaign, applied for divinity school and wrote most of it while sitting in a waffle house the application um for divinity school and then when i landed there uh i got to kind of work in this you know in, in kind of faith spaces um and work in, in churches and then also by accident while i was in divinity school ended up as an intern for 
the religion news service. Um, oh. And so, yeah, that was where I technically where I, where I started was there. And then when I got out of divinity school, I ended up at the Center for American Progress and more specifically, eventually Think Progress, their publication that exists within um, the various different organizations that make up CAP. And then uh, from there, ended up back where I started at the Religion News Service. So I've had a confluence of different connections um, that landed me onto the topic of the religious left and doing reporting on it. Yeah. So it, it and what was that, a 15 year span of time? How long has that whole thing been? That yeah, I guess, I guess if you're from, from college to now would probably be around 15 years. Um, and then, you know, the, but the project of reporting on the religious left itself arguably since 2011 and um, off and on in various capacities. I've been writing about that topic um, coming up on 10 years. So. Yeah. so really in 15 years, you've gotten nowhere is what you're saying. Like, no, it's you, basically. You've, you've been running in a circle <laughs> for 15 years. Uh, Just banging my head against the wall, really. Well, and that's part of, I, I'm only joking about that, of course. Great, great accomplishments. Congratulations. But this conversation about is there a religious movement in the left side of the political structure whether that means democrat or means something else is a whole debate but boy it feels as if the argument to be made yes there is or no there isn't a, a viable religious movement feels also like something that's been on a merry-go-round uh, yes. just time and time again for the last you know as you've done it for the last 10 years and i would you know i've been paying attention to it for maybe 20 and Boy, it feels like day by day we're still having to have an, a conversation with people to say, no, this is a real thing. It's something that exists in the world. Did, did that go into your wanting to write the definitive 2020 um, expose on the rise of the, uh, the religious roots of progressive politics and the ongoing fight for the soul of the country? Yeah, actually. Um, so that was the interesting thing about when I was doing this reporting early on. I one of the I mentioned this in the introduction to the book, but one of my earliest pieces for Religion News Service was that I went to this um, the, this protest camp as part of the Occupy Wall Street movement back in 2011, and they had a dedicated uh, faith tent in the Occupy Boston iteration of that movement. And when I got there, um, I write a little bit about it. I know there were these people singing hymns and there was just a lot of divinity school students and people affiliated with churches and um, people affiliated with seminaries who were, were involved with the actual um, Occupy encampment there in Boston. And what was interesting to me is I was like, I'm the only person who like was there as a reporter kind of reporting on this interesting dynamic as part of the Occupy movement. Fast forward a few years, and I, um, I remember I was talking to an editor at Think Progress before I was brought on board as a full-time religion reporter for them. And I was kind of doing some freelance work. And I, had try, I was trying to convince him that this was something worthwhile, that I, this, this protest that I had pitched to him about um, the religious left that, that had ha was happening that week, that was something worth covering. And he was like, oh, I don't know, like, it's just one of those stories. I'm not really sure if that's something it's going to pick up. And I was like, look, I'll just be honest with you, like, no one else is going to cover it. And he was like, what? And I was like, like maybe a couple of other people, but like it, these often go undercovered. And like to an editor, he was like, but people might read it. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, oh, so we have a, a permanent <laughs> scoop on this, on this topic. Well, why don't you go and report on it? And so then that ended up being a theme, which is that sometimes when you're a journalist and you go to, go to an event and you're the only journalist there, it feels like it's because it's not newsworthy and you're trying to make something out of nothing. But what I kept getting when I would go to these religious left gatherings and protests and demonstrations was that I was on to this interesting, fascinating story that so few other people were looking at. And irrespective of you, whether or not you agree with the religious left or their policy goals or anything in that regard, it's what I started to learn is that you couldn't deny that they were having an impact. They were having, you know, like their campaigns were proving successful in various ways. And so um, as I continued to report on it and then eventually you know, kind of turned it into a book, it, this is a reported book. This is, this is not just like a manifesto on what I think about religion or, or progressivism. This is me telling you what other activists have done so that at yeah, least right. there now is some record of saying you can have these debates over whether or not the religious left exists, quote unquote, but then 
my my counterpoint is it definitely exists like i've been there i've, I've reported <laughs> these things out it's just whether or not how do you feel about it is the other question yeah so. it's like that old joke i don't believe in baptism well i believe in baptism <laughs> son, i've seen it yeah <laughs> you've seen it right it's it's not even right. that you're and this is an important point i think for people who might be interested in this book and maybe you can describe what it means to be a reported book as opposed to an opinion book i've mm -hmm. only written the other kind so uh, in an opinion book, you're writing what you think the world is, what you think the world ought to be, what you are making your, your argument. Tell us what a reported book is as it relates to this particular topic. Yeah, so I'm, I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist. And so when I am reporting on these stories, I'm not advocating for the religious left, quote unquote. I'm not trying to advertise for them. I am only engaging in the kind of advocacy that all journalists engage in daily, which is that I think the subjects of my stories are interesting and worth your time, and that I think they're important. And so my goal in covering these protests is to help document and uncover and do a bit of analysis of explaining how they came to be. It's not inherently to preach at you, um, literally or figuratively, um, depending on you know the people in this book. Um, it's to try to expose and dig into these communities. And honestly, what's interesting about that and what's kind of fun about being a reporter in these contexts is um, you, a reporter gets to have access to certain people, either powerful people and not so powerful people um, that, that an average human being not, might not be able to get. It's precisely because they get to say, I'm a reporter, I'm trying to tell right. your story. And for some of these people, you know, they hear a reporter and they want to talk to you immediately. And some folks that I talked to in the book, you know, that was that was trust that took years to earn mm. um, to be able to say, you know, I, I want to be able to tell your story with authenticity um, as much as I can muster. And so th that's kind of what a, a reported work can bring to this space is that instead of trying to preach at you about it, I'm just trying to tell you these stories and just trying to expose the truth of what is happening. And then people can kind of interpret that as they see fit. Now, I, I want to acknowledge, you know, I break this book up into a lot of different siloed chapters. You know, there's like basically an immigration chapter, an LGBTQ, LGBTQ rights chapter, um, you know, an environmentalism chapter. And none of them are complete. There's really a book that can be written on each one of those chapters. But I got as close as I can to trying to unearth you know, looking at the last, you know, 10 to 20 years where these activists have had the greatest impact and where that I think they might end up um, in the future. So I'll ask you to speculate a little bit on something. Um, when okay. most people hear about a religious news service, what mm -hmm. flashes, I think, in many people's minds, even in mine, unless I think about the religion news service, because I know the difference, right. but people tend to hear things like the Christian Broadcasting Network. Right. Or what they're hearing is these are religious writers who are utilizing a news service to perpetuate their religious ideas. Because I think right, that's right. pretty much what the Christian Broadcasting Network and other, other networks like that do. Um, you're, uh, you're making it a, a point that you, you do something different than that. Uh, you're not doing your reporting as someone who's reporting on religion as an adherent you are trying to be a reporter who covers religion more like right, sports right. illustrated tend not to be athletes per se <laughs> they yeah. Be, yeah, no. I, don't, I don't know if well, that I mean, analogy holds up but no I, I well i hear what you're saying is actually important because you know so i at religion news service where i work right you know we're in partnership with the associated press and that's kind of the tack that we take we do i will tell you i do think there are many people who let us into events who think that we're the religious news service oh, yeah. um and then you know come to find out we're the we're a secular outlet that covers news um religion news but you know i'm of the disposition that i don't like there, there's this argument about journalists um you know kind of the argument around bias and or or influence and i don't take the position that human beings can be unbiased i don't think that's a thing a human being can be um but for me the greater challenge of a journalist isn't to pretend that they don't have political views or theological views, et cetera. It's to know that about yourself and then push yourself beyond it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, that that to me is more impressive than just being a robotic automaton, automaton that, that doesn't have views and like that sort of thing. And so what I try to bring to this book, and it, it, the book is a little different because I do actually get to put pieces of my own 
narrative in there because it's the only way I can explain access to certain things. But you know, my perspective isn't to, to tell you as a member of the religious left, that's not what I'm writing. I'm writing the story of as a reporter, these are the communities that I've been able to interact with and report on and unearth stories of um, in the midst of this, the, the past you know, 10 to 20 years. Do, do you consider yourself a part of the religious left? Uh, I, I think, you know, at Think Progress, I was probably de facto a part of it just because Think Progress is part of progressive media. And so in the sense that when I wrote stories, um, you know, Think Progress had an editorial slant for which they were unapologetic insofar, like they are unapologetically progress. It's there in the name. Um, and so in this, insofar as Think Progress was considered to be part of the left, if you wrote about religion, not just me, but any of my colleagues at, our, um, at Think Progress when it was around, um, we were de facto a component of that. But me personally, um, I don't consider myself an activist or an advocate in the religious left. That's not my job. My job is to help tell stories and, and, and unearth truth about different groups of people. I will say that I am, you know, in the same way a health, you know, it, it's, it's a similar question you could ask if you ask an immigration reporter, are they an immigrant, um, immigration advocate, right? Are they an immigrant advocate? No, but they are one of the few groups of people who are consistently telling the stories of immigrants and immigrant rights groups and, right. you know, unearthing truths in those spaces. So they don't have to take an advocacy stand, um, stance. They're just trying to deliver the truth as they see it. And I take a similar stance within the context of religion. Nice. So I have, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Oh, I was just curious. I'm, uh, I'm here in South Bend, and so um, I view oh, a yeah. lot of this through the lens of Mayor Pete. And um, you know, he was, for a lot of people, sort of the, the first politician openly talking about his faith on the progressive side. And uh, just curious on your thoughts on uh, his campaign bringing some of those you know, political left religious issues to the fore. He had an interesting campaign. Um, he he was certainly, I mean, this last Democratic primary, there was a lot of God talk from uh, across the board with a lot of candidates. Um, like it was one of those things where I was like, I, I can't keep track of it all. Like normally I'm like the one person like finding these stories and instead I'm like, I, they're all saying God things all the time. But Mayor Pete was interesting because it was such a key component of his political persona. Like arguably, um, and I write about this in the book, arguably his candidacy went from zero to 60 because mm. of that scene in town hall where he was asked about Mike Pence. And then he gave this response that was saying, that was comparing, you know, Pete Buttigieg's faith um, against that of Mike Pence, kind of arguing over the course of that answer that maybe Mike Pence had kind of sold out a little bit um, for what he called the porn star presidency and that he didn't ascribe to the same faith um, that uh, Pete Buttigieg did, which he said was about welcoming the stranger and welcoming the immigrant. And so what I think is interesting um, about that campaign was that then he, like, he was like out there literally saying, like, I, I'm, I think it's time for a revival of the religious left, et cetera, et cetera. And then he like showed up at William Barber's Poor People's Campaign yeah, poor people's um, protest outside of the White House. And this was like a fascinating thing because I was I was covering it that day. And I was just like, you know, I went there and I was like filming. It was, you know, like taking pictures of the different faith leaders as they marched down to the park, Lafayette Park, right in front of the White House. And then I like turned around to go figure out where I was going to stand in the park. And then there was like Pete Buttigieg behind me. And I was like, what, like, what do you, what do you do? And then like all the other reporters turned around at the same time and were like, I guess Pete Buttigieg is here. And so we like went over there and what was fascinating is that he didn't say a word. Like he wanted there to be a silent, wanted to be there to be a silent witness during that protest. So the photo op that came out of that wasn't, you know, a presidential candidate on stage at a religious gathering preaching to a church, which is what often happens in religious right contexts. It was Pete Buttigieg literally sitting at the feet of William Barber. Um, it was a very different posture. And so I thought what was really interesting about his campaign was, and, and also he was an openly gay man and, you know, an Episcopalian which I have a whole chapter on that in the book where I kind of talk about how a lot of the internal advocacy within that tradition paved the way for mm -hmm. someone like Pete Buttigieg to kind of occupy that space in public without much controversy in terms of his, like being able to be a Christian who is openly gay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a little tidbit at the very conclusion, uh, in, in the conclusion about him and Gene Robinson that I'll leave for readers to find that I thought was fascinating. Um, but I do think, 
his campaign was interesting in terms of vocalizing, um, you know, literally, you know, saying the words religious left out loud. Now, I do want to be clear in that, you know, there were people like Cory Booker um, and Marianne Williamson and Kamala Harris. I mean, she dropped liberation theology into her like opening uh, announcement <laughs> speech. I know. Um, it was just like a lot of people who were willing to engage with that. But I do think that Pete Buttigieg, who by the time he left was the only candidate with, that had a national faith outreach director, who, if I recall correctly, used to be on the steering committee for the Poor People's Campaign, which tells you a lot about the connections that you saw between the, these, this activist religious left and at least Pete Buttigieg's um, campaign staff. Well, and I, I think you bring this up uh, in the in the book. I've read excerpts of it. Just it just, it just came out today, everyone. So you know, uh, yeah, <laughs> three hundred and forty three pages of yes, yeah, not short. Sorry, finally <laughs> wanted uh, sentences. But you you raised the point that there was some pushback when Pete started to say, "Hey, religious left," that other people were saying, "Whoa, whoa, whoa." There has been a religious left for a long time, and you do a great job in the book of wanting to build a history of this. And there was some pushback of, here we go again, as soon as sort of a middle America white guy starts to talk about something, this now catches all the attention. And there was some, I think, appropriate pushback of not everyone knowing how to honor the larger tradition of a religious voice in a political call for a for justice and um, social engagement, uh, you know, uh, uh, package deal. Is is that right? Do I have that right? That you were you were picking up on some of some of that story, and that the Buttigieg level of attention uh, created a bit of controversy for people who are being sensitive about that. That oh, yeah, I, I I think there was like I mean there was immediate pushback in the sense that you know people paid attention to the religious life when Pete Buttigieg said it and said it, but they didn't even pay attention as much when Cory Booker, for instance, said it. Um, but I I do think too the, what was interesting about that moment, and I talk about this in the book, was that he initially after he said you know we for, we should have a revival of the religious left, the next time he talked about that on camera or in, in, you know being recorded, he changed it a little bit where he said. You know, the religious left has actually been going on for quite some time without recognition, which says a lot about the influence of the religious left in that conversation, because right. it's very difficult to read that shift and not see that he probably got some pushback. He probably heard from some people who said, hey, by the way, like this has been around for quite some time and they deserve acknowledgement, too. So that I, there's a little bit of a, a shift there where, yes, Buttigieg got a lot of the attention for it. Um, but even he became self-aware about how that might have been. Uh, disproportionate to his campaign um, compared to the amount, the number of activism, a number of activists and the raw amount of activism that preceded him talking about it. Well, and I think that's an important part of the book. Again, for those who are just picking up here, it's called American Prophets. Um, it, one of the, the curious arguments here is that even though there's been a robust religious left, if you like that phrase, movement mm -hmm. going on in the United States for quite a while, most people don't know about it. Yeah. And they do know about the religious right. You, you, like, you don't have to be part of the religious right. You don't even have to know a lot about politics or religion to know that the religious right has been a force of politics and cultural formation in the United States for 40 plus years. Even though there's been a 60 or 80 year uh, definitive movement of the religious left, you know, going back to the 1950s and forward. Mm -hmm. But people don't know about it. So this is one of the curious things. And inside the religious left movement, there there is a kind of territorialism that all of us oh, who yeah. worked in this space have recognized. And that dynamic of not paying the proper homage to the history, which has been a fault from a lot of us, but also the idea that that's what catches all the attention and that's where all the energy goes is um, not getting the word out to one another, but an inward reflecting recognition of what's already gone on. Some people, and I'm one of these, have tried to contend that's part of our problem on the religious left is that we spend more time making sure that we all are recognized and not an equal amount of time of making sure that people outside of the movement recognize that it exists. And it doesn't always have as much of a forward public facing 
uh, approach as I wish that it would, and I think that it might uh, have now, as it did in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies. It's almost like there was a lull when the religious left movement became very concerned about itself in a way, as opposed to being concerned about the the public imagination. Uh, but maybe that's just my opinion. Did you chase any of that out in the reporting, or do you think any of that well, has some validity? So I, I think this is this is a conversation I've. I've heard in, a, in an internal criticism I have heard not only within religious left circles, I've heard it within progressive activist circles in general. And so there is there is there are some who argue that one of the great strengths and challenges of organizing on the left is that whereas you know people talk about you know why can't the religious left have the same clout and influence and you know just ironclad political machine that you find and the religious right. And, and people often say, yeah, but there's nothing like the religious right on the left in general. Like there is no solid block of one uniform like machine politics group of people on the left that looks like the religious right. Like that, the left just doesn't, isn't organized that way. The modern progressive coalition, the modern democratic party is really kind of a coalition of coalitions. I mean, the religious right relative to the left is significantly more hegemonic. It's significantly more uniform theologically, racially, um, you know, compared to all these different groups that are trying to organize on the left. And so one of the things that you often find, you know, what I found in covering it from the religious left angle, but I think is also true of progressive activist circles in general, is that a lot of these these different, you know, mini coalitions have had to advocate for themselves for so long just to get recognized, even within the party, even within the progressive power structure. Mm. So what that means, and when you're starting to do something big together, is that you are kind of having to do a lot more, uh, you know, uh, kind of connective, build a lot more connective tissue between these groups, mm -hmm. um, intra organizing than what you will find on the right. And what's interesting about that to me is that for a lot of these um, progressive movements, not not um, all of them, but for a lot of them, some of the people doing the hardest work to forge those connections are members of the religious left, precisely yeah. because of their sensitivity to these sort of, you know, the these moral questions and moral quandaries. So the ones who are like making it okay for these different, you know, you know issue-based advocacy groups that hang out with each other, the, the power brokers, the, the peace offerings are often being brokered mm -hmm. by progressive people of faith. So I, I say all that because I think I've heard that frustration for a long time in um, pro progressive activism spaces and the religious left, but I'm not sure how, how quickly that'll go away. However, I will say that one of the most interesting things about this um, broader movement over the last 15 years has been when Trump arrived, yeah. There was this common uniform um, cause to, to kind of resist, you know, literally right. and figuratively Trump and his, his presidency. And that allowed for a really quick and swift amount of uh, organizing and coalition building between groups that otherwise had never hung out together um, in a way that I hadn't seen throughout the course of my reporting. And so there's a question of what happens if Trump actually loses in November, if that co those coalitions stay together. But um, but there is that. Now, there's a whole other question we can talk about later about the difference between kind of prophetic witness and power building and whether or not those two things are mutually exclusive. But generally speaking, I, I just want to say, yeah, I have definitely run into that same conversation in my reporting. Mm -hmm. For people that grew up uh, more in the religious right, is there anything uh, in your reporting that you think that they would find surprising, like some common ground or common threads that? Well, I, I think one of the things that's interesting about, and th these are general sweeping claims that are not like, that they can be disproven by in small granular levels, but generally speaking, the religious right has proven itself really willing and eager to attach themselves to power, right? So they, they have, uh, and they, in, in, in a practical strategic sense, that is effective. Um, they feel very strongly for one, uh, in, in terms of, you know, showing up on election day, making an impact on the ballot box. That's why white evangelical Protestants in particular and the religious right in general tends to vote outside, um, like with uh, bigger numbers than they actually have on the ground. Their influence on the electorate is stronger than their actual population size. Um, and they also have prioritized, you know, the courts, you know, making sure that they get judges and justices into spaces of power that they can then vote and rule in their favor. 
by comparison, the religious left has proven itself far more effective um, at the art of protest, the poetry of protest. That's where you see, like, you don't really remember the religious right for their, like, galvanizing, inspiring moments of being arrested in front of some place. Like, those are things that you remember of, like, Martin Luther King, right? Those are the things you remember nowadays for immigrant rights activists, those sorts of things. Those are the kinds of mechanisms mm -hmm. that the religious left often uses. And as I write in my book, those turn out to be pretty powerful in specific contexts. Mm -hmm. You know, when we see the, the administration shifting in 1980s because of the original sanctuary movement, when we see the Affordable Care Act, you know, get brought across the finish line in the end, in a lot, large part because of these progressive faith activists that have been doing this kind of harging in, you know, in the streets work. But that's a different kind of approach to power building in our republic than you find in the religious right. So while the sermons are equally as, you know, um, affecting, um, you know, I think the drama that the religious left brings to um, the, the, the project of power building is different from the drama that the religious right brings. Now, I will say, though, that is starting to change. You are starting to see religious left more involved in campaigns in particular. And I bring out this example in the book, the Senate election in Alabama, where Roy Moore was defeated by Doug Jones, and Doug Jones became the first you know, Democratic candidate there in a, in a long time, a Democratic senator from that state in, in a long time. Um, the influence of African-American Protestants in helping give him that admittedly that Roy Moore was also a uniquely flawed candidate. Um, like, but that, that electorate did show up and could push beyond the margins. And people are starting to take that seriously um, as we get more and more elections where the margins are so small. But, uh, but in the meantime, in general trends, I think someone who, if they were reared in the religious right and they were expecting the religious left to have that same approach to affecting change, they're gonna be disappointed. It's a very different system that mm -hmm. they've, they've um, built for themselves. So, Jack, I think that's a very uh, well-described difference of the religious right organizing for power, the religious left organizing for protest. Mm -hmm. Not to overly summarize that, <laughs> but as a reporter, yeah, uh, do you think both of those are have the possibility of being effective? I, I think my in my reporting and in my research, it depends, right? So, I mean, like. But showing up on election day generally makes a difference. Um, and having a judge rule in your favor generally makes a difference. And protesting to the point where legislation gets passed and the votes get whipped in your favor, all of those are effective um, pieces of change. The question is, you know, if you're, if you're, let's say you're a Democratic Party strategist, you would like all of the above, please, right? You would like people in positions of power who can hold the line there. And you would like the protesters who can show up and galvanize the, the, the public to support whatever agenda that you have. I mean, a, a true monopoly on American power um, would, would be able to do all of those things at once all at the same time. And I've never seen any um, power structure fully able to do it all at once. Um, arguably the last time that that, that that really happened completely was back in like the 1930s or 1920s and 1930s when liberal Christianity actually kind of won. And then that like, when triggered the retreat from public um, life um, by Christian conservatives before they came roaring back later. Um, but it, it is one of those things where I do think all of those approaches can be effective in specific ways. But, you know, you, you really do. You, if, you're, if you're trying to build a lasting coalition, just as a student of politics, um, you're kind of you kind of want all of the above if you can. Yeah, boy, I, I agree. And I'll say somebody that wants to be on the ins you know, inside of this game, uh, working for it. I, I have felt the struggle between arguing for policy and working to change the policy maker. And I have concluded that it's about the policy makers, not about mm -hmm. the policy. And the idea that you're going to spend equity trying to bump policy makers to reconsider a particular policy and you're kind of going to work one by one through the through the policies that are passed by our state uh, local and federal government is not the way that democracy works we are a mm -hmm. representative form of democracy in my opinion and i've converted to this view that the mm -hmm. only way you do that is to change the policy maker and mm -hmm. that is something that I think just as just editorialize for a moment is hard for people on the progressive side of American life, including politics, because we want to point out the systemic problems that we are all living under. 
And the conservative side tends to say it's about the wrong people. And there's this big debate, whether it's a person or it's the, the, the systemic um, realities in the system. So are we going to change the people? Or are we going to change the system? You can change the system through policies and through teaching and through education and all that. And the other way is oh, you, you just swap out people. And uh, I think that there's some move. I think there's some shift happening in our society and our culture. That's, and look, I'll just say this. If Donald Trump doesn't show us anything, he shows us it's about the person, not about the not about the policy. And um, he is so uniquely bad, and especially in comparison to the way Barack Obama was trying to utilize systemic change and policy uh, movement, and then some wrecking ball just comes rolling in, uh, or the governor of Florida, or the governor of Atlanta currently, or the governor of, of Ohio. We'll throw one to a, a bone to a, to a Republican in Ohio who seems to be doing a decent, decent job. And this obsession inside the progressive movement, and especially inside the progressive religious movement, to not want to identify leaders and to not want people to rally around someone and rather to rally around a cause or a value statement or a, uh, a, a policy position. I just think most voters have no idea. I mean, most voters that I know, they don't vote for policies. They vote for people. You know, we don't have referenda like they do in California and most of the country. We have a person's name on the ballot. And for some reason, the political left and the religious left just continues to obsess about policies to the point that I get emails regularly that tell me about house numbers on on uh, bills that are going to be passed, like, you know, in, in email exchanges. So do, you've written a book about the American prophets, about the people who are involved in this. Are, do you have a thought about that little rant I just went on there? Do you have a do you have a take on this people versus policies thing? Yeah, I mean, there's a reason I call the book American prophets and not American policy wonks. Like there's a, like, yeah, the, 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 the religious left is, is, is at current most comfortable in that prophetic role. I mean, it is, it is the, the shout against those in power, irrespective of power. Now, for instance, I mean, I, I use the term religious left a lot in the book and I have to couch it because I, and I explained this in the introduction, like most people who I might label the religious left in, in a categorical sense really don't like that term. Yeah. And they don't like it because for a variety of reasons, some of which are political, some of which are they just don't want to be associated with the religious right and how they don't like how they attach themselves to power. And so the reflexive nature of a lot of the religious left activists that I've gotten to know has been, look, you know, like I, I'm not, I'm no fan of any candidate. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of, of this, this systemic change because if I attach myself to power, then I wouldn't be able to ha keep a prophetic witness. But there has been some shifting on that. I mean, I think it's interesting that you had people like advocates like Linda Sarsour, one of the co-chairs of the Women's March, and Cornell West, um, who's you know been arrested at any number of activist activism events and protests, um, just line up to you know to stump for Bernie Sanders. I mean, they were like unapologetic about saying, "No, I'm like going to promote this person as a candidate." And it was, it was actually the uh, the the Sanders campaign both in 2016 and and in 2020 as well as the attention around Alexandria Ocasio Cortez who by the way apparently was decided to run for office because of a religious spirit experience that she had at Standing Rock which is in chapter seven um, but the uh, of American but, prophets on sale today yeah, exactly um, but what what you find around that is this interesting kind of moment in um, in kind of like the more hard charging um progressive and more in the more literal sense leftist part of the party who say hey you know maybe maybe we do want to get behind this candidate to get things done and actually the bernie sanders lost this go round. there's been some evidence and it's kind of like the think pieces i'm reading and some some influential voices in that space of that kind of more really hard left area of the party and of the progressive coalition who kind of seen his loss as this wake up call who they're like, and some folks are just mad he lost and think, you know, burn it all down. But then other folks are like, maybe we haven't done the work to build power to elect the kinds of people that we really want to get elected. And when you have someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who they think, think of as really holding the line in Congress, well, if you want to hold the line more, if you want to get those policies passed, you're going to need a lot more of people like her elected into 
um, Congress and, and even your state and um, legislator. And so I think that that conversation is starting to get kicked back in part for precisely what you articulated, Doug, like once because Trump got elected and because they've seen how, you know, so many pieces of legislation were almost repealed or have been beaten back by this Republican Senate and previously Republican House and Senate. Um, I do think there's this moment where the left is kind of taking more seriously the influence of elected officials in our representative democracy. But again, I'm really curious about how the religious left interacts with that um, because that's that's kind of, it's not a new thing that they're interacting with candidates, but the systemic level that they're doing it at right now, including the work that you're doing, um, is is relatively new. And so in terms of like the, 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 the level of organization attached to it. So I'm curious to see what that looks like um, in in coming in 2020 and then like the election cycles after that, if suddenly you have, you know, religious left candidates, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I hear it all the time and have for the last five years, people saying things like, well, be careful that you don't just become the religious right. That point that you were raising, right, that there's this disdain for that. And, uh, you know, I. I think those are really good, uh, really good warnings. Right. I mean, I don't know. I think the problem is the religious right is mean and <laughs> does selfish, bad things. Uh, the problem isn't that they're uh, that they're in conversation with politics. I think it's what they're doing with it. But uh, I could be totally I could be totally wrong about that. Um, do you think the religious left and the prophets of the um, uh, of the religious left need to have more to say than simply welcome the welcome the stranger and care for the poor. Like, look, I'm all about Matthew 25, but there's more to a religious Christian, at least the Christian uh, context of this, more of a religious message than simply care for the poor and make sure you welcome the stranger. Uh, I don't think we can say that too much, but I think we could err on only saying that. And the religious right and the conservative movement that's taken over the religious right they actually are making a theory of the case that tends to work wide and broadly. I think they're wrong about it. I think it's wrong biblically. I think it's wrong socially. I think it's wrong politically. But they're making a case. And man, when I hear religious people on the left start talking, everyone comes back to Matthew 25, care for the stranger. We have to make sure that the least of these. And it kind of ends there. And I wonder if that's going to be satisfactory to a religious left movement if the content of the argument is that is that truncated. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's not that truncated. But that's what I hear so, 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 so often. Well, so I, I, I'm not I'm not going to advise the religious left. But what I can say is what I've seen has been effective um, in power building in general, which is that, as you point out, the religious right has very powerful rhetoric that resonates with a certain group of people, their electorate. And rhetoric is clearly powerful irrespective of religious tradition, irrespective of political persuasion. I mean, that's like the welcoming, the reason people were coming back to that welcoming the stranger, I mean, I think that's kind of evidence of this really faith-rooted, belief-rooted mm -hmm. um, element that kind of inspires the religious left that, that other elements of the left, the more secular left, don't have they they do have like what they would say you know more secular approaches to the same epic but the religious left can often in the christian context the jewish context the muslim context can return to these foundational principles and you know be be zealous in the most literal way possible um to protect others however you know like as you point out the religious right the connections between that rhetoric and a very specific call list that you can have to call your legislator and a very specific policy agenda that's been up on the website for the last eight years. And, you know, I think that those are all things that they've, they, they've, you know, they've really shortened the distance between the different levers of power for the average person, the religious right to be able to actualize that power. And I think on the religious left, that's more, that those, they're more distant. Like there is this sort of moral beating heart of the progressive movement. Mm -hmm. And I think the religious left sits deep within that. Um, but you, but it's a relatively new phenomenon mm. to have some of the leaders of the religious left also be actively engaged in the policy making agenda. Now, to be fair, um, the black church has been there for quite some time um, helping you know, establish policies and have also been advising new candidates in, in some ways for, for decades and decades. However, um, you know, understanding that the religious left is broader and wider than just liberal white mainliners, the black church. It's also, um, you know, the Hispanic evangelicals. It's, it's also Muslim Americans. And all of those are occupying spaces of influence and power in the, in the progressive um, spaces now. Like, 
they, you know, having those sorts of conversations where they're in the policy making room, where they're the ones who are saying, okay, like the people we normally farm out, they're designing this policy to, not only do I want to be involved in the conversation about how we advocate for this, I also want to be involved in the building of the policy itself. And that's why you start to have these organizations like the Poor People's Campaign, like Network, that they put out these like faithful budgets, as they call it, mm -hmm. every year and that sort of stuff. And whether or not those are having the same influence in the kind of institutional Democratic Party um, is, is an open question. And I think, I think a lot of them are frustrated that they are not getting the same kind of traction within the institutional left as they used to. Mm -hmm. But because of Trump yeah. and because that the, um, the, you know, so many of these visible resistance protests were led by members of the religious left, they suddenly have way more access to the candidates themselves than they used to. I mean, there's a reason why when they had the Poor People's Campaign uh, Candidates Forum last year, nine candidates came, including Biden and Kamala Harris and Elizabeth Warren um, and Bernie Sanders. Like they all showed up, all the, all the front runners. And then uh, when Netroots had their presidential candidates forum a few like weeks later, they only got four. And Netroots is like this established progressive space. But these activists had kind of proven their mettle in the streets. And so I think you're starting to see more conversations between the power brokers in the party and in the um, in, in, you know, liberalism in the institutional sense and these activists. But that's a they're rebuilding that structure, if, it, if that makes any sense. So I want to just dig back into this uh, comment you made earlier about there was a lot of God talk in the Democratic primary. I don't think they were all pandering. I think there's a lot of religious uh, history to many candidates that are. And this was a this was a politician rich Democratic uh, um, a field. Right. There were some outsiders. You know, you had a, a Tom right. Steyer in the type. But the others, you know, they were governors and they were senators and they were Congress people. And they have a very deep religious drive for what they're doing. Nancy Pelosi, famously, right, oh, is, yeah. is one of these people. Um, why do you think that's been so quiet inside the Democratic circles? And I'll say I believe it's been extremely quiet that there are people whose faith is meaningful to them. And then for whatever reason, whether it was Buttigieg or Trump or Trump and Pence or going after this 81 percent of the evangelicals, that candidates started talking about it in a way that, I mean, maybe Barack Obama did, um, but not nearly as uh, as profoundly as all of these candidates seem to be rooting their own stump speeches and um, and interview questions, responses in some sort of a faith narrative. What do you think is going on there? Why was it so quiet and why did they turn on the switch and, and start talking about it so much? Yeah, um, so that I, have, I have a lot of like meta theories about this that I'll try to like bury because I, I have like, this is a big existential question that I think a lot of different people who cover religion and politics are fascinated by because the conventional wisdom or at least the, the truism that emerged early on was that, okay, the Democratic Party just isn't really comfortable with religion and there's there's not, there's just like fewer religious people in the Democratic Party, and so that's why they just for years like just were more reticent to talk about faith in the public sphere compared to the religious right. And I do think there's a kernel of truth to that. Um, but I also think that like, the, and I'll, I'll try to not go off on this for too long, but the development of civil religion in the United States, certain phrases that that um, politicians make, of, uh, you know, or a president in presidential rhetoric when they'll make this offhand reference to scripture. Um, that that is kind of almost accepted as just a thing that presidents do. That was developed not exclusively, but in large part by liberal Christians, um, mm -hmm. by mainline Christians in the mid 20th century when they occupied a significantly more power than they do now. And so if, if the United States is not a theocracy, but if it ever was a theocracy in the 20th century, it was mostly like a liberal Christian theocracy. And they, they their values had been weren't explicitly religious, but those values from their faith traditions had been inculcated into different, like the mainstream media, as it were, the mainstream conversation and these institutions of government and power. And so, and this is the argument that the religious right makes quite that, you know, that when they talk about these godless heathens that are the Democrats or, you know, or liberals and progressives, if you trace that, that line of dialogue back to the early 20th century, 
they've been saying a version of that since what we were, know as the fundamentalist modernist split between Christians in the early 20th century. And what they said instead was, oh, these people have capitulated to culture. So their faith isn't real. It's, you know, or not, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's heresy or it's like emer- a, a divorce from the fundamentals. So fast forward, um, there, you know, 1999, 2000, and then you know, when you have John Kerry run in 2004, um, John Kerry was more hesitant to talk about his faith. And when he did talk about it, it got him in trouble because, you know, his, his position on abortion was um, not welcomed by the Catholic Church and he didn't want to take it head on. And he didn't want to take on this progressive religious tradition mm-hmm. um, position head on. And so it kind of fumbled. So enter Barack Obama, who did have the, had the most robust faith outreach cam- um, efforts of any Democrat in the last like 20, 30 years was part of his campaign, um, kind of reclaiming it in this institutional sense in, like, as a president, and while the religious right rejected it out of hand, I think what you started to see, not necessarily just because of Obama, but because some of the movements Obama emerged out of, these like small little inflection points where people were like really frustrated that the religious right had taken this rhetoric from them. And in some ways, it's like you, you saw beginning around 2004, around the re-election of George Bush, um, several organizations get founded in several institutional liberals and progressives, you know, p- uh, people like John Podesta, who I began the book with, start making these groups and organizations specifically geared towards taking that rhetoric back. And it's basically liberal Christians and liberal people of faith, um, you know, liberal followers of Judaism and Islam, who are trying to say, okay, we've, we used to have a monopoly on this, and that's clearly gone away. So how do we reinvent the wheel for this modern context to the point where now um, when you have people like Kamala Harris dropping liberation theology into her presidential announcement, and you have people like Pete Buttigieg talking about religion in his Democratic campaign, it's kind of the, the, arguably the development of a new form of, um, of uh, civil religion that's emerging on the left that uh, is a little more like stalwartly um, progressive, but also more stalwartly religious yeah, in its right. articulation. So I think it's an interesting meta time. And I, I ran across that a lot when I was doing the reporting for this book um, because it's happening both at the activist level and at the candidate level. That's Jack Jenkins. The book is American Prophets and um, feels like it should be one of those one of those t- television shows, you know, where they spell prophets for now. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did you get the word prophets on that? American prophets, uh, like the Old Testament prophets. So that's an interesting question. Uh, there was, I went to a gathering, I believe it was late 2017. Is that, or yeah, late 2017 going into 2018. Um, that what was then called PICO and is now called Faith in Action. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they had um, developed a, uh, they, they had this little conference and they called it the Prophetic Resistance Conference. Mm-hmm. And one of the leaders of the conference stood up and like the, the line, the rhetorical line that became kind of the de facto uh, slogan of the conference was, are you, um, mm. are you, are you a, a prophet of the resistance or a chaplain to the empire? Um, the implication being you don't want to be a chaplain to the empire. And it reminded me that I had so often, irrespective of tradition, run into this conversation about the prophetic tradition in progressive activist circles. And it reminded me back to a story I tell in the introduction of the book, which is that, you know, when I, I was reporting on that Occupy movement and I went into this interfaith, you know, prayer tent in the Occupy Boston encampment. And as I walked in, they, you know, um, they were all finishing a hymn and they turned around and pointed at me and told me I had to take off my shoes. And so when I removed my shoes, um, because there was apparently a giant cardboard sign telling you you have to remove shoes, I remembered that, um, you know, in many traditions, you have to take off your shoes before you enter into a venerated place of worship. And that's often rooted in the stories of a very particular group of people who are asked to remove their shoes before walking onto holy ground to talk to the divine. And those are prophets. And so, you know, that concept of a prophet, of someone who often is decrying the government or decrying those in leadership, often without the recognition they deserve um, in, in their time and place, but also feeling compelled to do it because of their faith, irrespective of the consequences, mm-hmm. um, seem to ring true with this concept of, of, of progressive religious activism. So you, you finish the book with the... Um... A lean into the future, chapter twelve, mm-hmm. a chapter I did read. Um, yes, because you know why? Why you know why not start at the end? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you are you um, 
And even that chapter isn't, um, it's a reported chapter. It's not like, and after all this study, here's what I think the future ought to look like. You try to describe some things that have been happening more recently. Um, do you have a sense that the political system as it currently exists will engage with the religious movements? We've been doing a lot of talking about how the religious movements want to engage in the political system, but there's another side to that, to that relationship, right? And that is the mm -hmm. political system. Will it acknowledge and accept the engagement of, of political people or is all the weight going to continue to rest on the religious communities, Christian, Jewish, Islam, Sikh, others to figure out how to be, you know, to borrow re relationship metaphor here to be the right kind of partner for politics, or do you think politics, the political system will do any work to try to connect with the religious movements? Yeah. I mean, I think uh, the dynamics of that relationship are going to change. I mean, to be fair, you know, politicians often will, decide to work with religious groups when it behooves them, right? Like that's, that's, that's been true, um, irrespective of a party or tradition um, or ideology for quite some time. I mean, you know, the, the Trump has proven himself super happy to engage with the religious groups as often as possible. Um, and, but I do think that there has been, I, I don't think it's inconsequential that we've seen these candidates over the last few months really heavily engage with these activists. I mean, Joe Biden, when he spoke at that Poor People's Campaign president, um, presidential candidates forum, he uh, actually, he, he tried to articulate one of the talking points of the Poor People's Campaign and actually botched it. Um, but, uh, and so the, the Washington Post did this whole like fact check of, like a whole fact checker fact check of Joe Biden's conversation around poverty. But the fact that he felt obligated to want to talk about it. Like he was like, no, I want to make this claim about, you know, how many people are um, poor or low income in the United States. And I want to like really engage with what you're talking about here um, was an interesting shift because I don't think that back in 20, um, you know, 2004, that John Kerry would have even known who these groups were mm -hmm. um, and, or like shown up to their events to like make sure that they, he hears what they have to say on these um, policy issues. And so I think what, what we are seeing is some um, willingness among this, this new crop of Democratic candidates to recognize the power and influence um, that these activists have accrued through their protests and demonstrations um, over the past three or four years. And so that only leads to more engagement. But to be perfectly honest, I think that one of the elements of activism mm -hmm. is that if politicians aren't just going to come to you because you exist like they're you're you're always going to have to um you know there's a, always there's always an element of politics of having to push and push and push and so the very nature of activism is that you want to do that all the time but um i don't think that well i do think uh, democrats are taking the religious left more seriously and their leadership more seriously um i would be very surprised if you know suddenly all, um, you know, Sister Simone Campbell, you could just say, yeah, all right, well, they're just going to come to my offices now. I don't have to go over to the Hill to talk to them. You know, they'll just email me um, every day. Um, I think it's still going to require a lot of reaching out um, before you hear back. Uh, you you spend a lot of time in the book and do a great job of describing the national setting. Do you see anything happening on the state house or the state assembly side on the religious movements? There's a lot of that. There's a lot of local organizing that's going on with protest activism and engagement activism from religious communities. It has nothing to do with the, the federal system. Mm -hmm. you, um, have you reported on much of that? I know that's not really what the book is about, but is there, is there something happening with the, the religious left's influence at the state level? Yeah, I mean, I, arguably, that's what all the rest of this is based on, right? I mean, you know, groups like Faith in Action, they, uh, their strength comes from all of these localized groups that, you know, hold these um, every year for like mayoral candidates or gubernatorial candidates, um, or state rep candidates ha have these, uh, these sessions where they'll line them up on a stage and they'll be, you know, they'll, they'll ask them a yes or no question. Will you support this policy? And everybody like waits for their answer. And if they don't give a good one, they'll like mark it down. Um, you see that all over the country, these interfaith groups have been doing that for years. 
And, um, and that was actually the model that you've now seen replicated at the national level. Similarly, you know, one of the more successful, in 2016, um, you know, one of the only bright spots for Democrats was that while Trump was elected, the um, Republican governor of North Carolina was unseated. And they credit that, a lot of analysts credit that, um, the unseating of that Republican governor with the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina, which again was led by Warren Barber and a bunch of other folks. And that was, that was a sustained years long faith rooted advocacy push to help push back against a, what they saw as a draconian or regressive state legislator. And those movements are going to continue to exist um, even if all of the national pieces fall apart. I mean, that's kind of one of the things I found most interesting is that, you know, you'll find um, these, these state representatives who often they're like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of terrified of the local um, faith-based activist group because we know that they, they, at that level, they have way more power right. because, you know, like if you, if you have two or three churches that are all united for or against a candidate or for or against a piece of legislation in one state Senate district, I mean, that's a lot of people that can move a needle um, and potentially unseat mm -hmm. somebody in the next session. So it's, it's one of those things where I do think that's continuing to happen. And if anything, those bonds have been strengthened um, by this groundswell of activism, you know, in, right. in the aftermath of Trump's election. So uh, honestly, I, not only do I think that that's, that that is happening, I would argue that that, that will happen even if all of the people at the national level, um, you know, vanish tomorrow, they, the folks who don't get much recognition or press attention will still be knocking on the doors of their state legislators demanding change. Well, that is Jack Jenkins, smartest person to understand American politics from a religious perspective. The book is American Prophets, The Religious Roots of Progressive Politics and the Ongoing Fight for the Soul of the Country. And it was number one on Amazon today. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, oh, Amazon no, I did not see that. Amazon Religion Sociology, number one. What? Yeah. Yeah, I did a, not know that. You got a screenshot awesome. that it was a number one. It was number one. And that was just hours ago. So it probably hasn't oh, probably hasn't updated yet. I would go screenshot that and no uh, start, start pitching that around. So you're number one uh, and uh, our favorite uh, author. All right. Uh, today on the 21st of April. Uh, so the Vote Common Good podcast favorite author of April 21st fame. Uh, Dan, any final well, uh, final thoughts or questions for uh, Jack Jenkins? No, just appreciate you taking the time. Um, follow you on Twitter and really appreciate your voice. So, yeah. Well, I deeply appreciate it. And while my musical selection is not the same as yours, I do have a ukulele back there. It's, oh, you know, nice. roughly <laughs> not the quite the same quality as the instruments you have behind you, but I do have, do have the one. Do you, oh. do, you have a, do you have a song on the ukulele you'd like to take us out with? Should there be a closing? You know, uh, I feel like that would just be a disservice to your, <laughs> or your listeners. So <laughs> I will spare them that for now. The ukulele. Well, congratulations. Hope the book is uh, on every bookshelf and on every Kindle uh, all across the country. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Thanks, yeah, buddy. Thank you.